Hello again. Thank you for being here. It's because of you why my channel is growing at a lovely steady pace and I'm really, really grateful for that. So in this video, what I wanted to do was explain how the stop system works on your lawnmower, but I wanted to take a somewhat mundane subject and make it a little bit more educational. So I've included there electron flow, why copper is so conductible on the atomic level, showing you why, why the atoms allow that to happen, and a good way of testing the system using a multimeter. But the whole essence of this video and all of my other videos is not just to show you how to do something, but it's to go into an unusual depth to give you a deeper understanding and a greater knowledge of the subject. And to do this with plenty of visual content. And hopefully then you'll get a really firm understanding of what's going on. So let's get to it. OK, so in order to get a firm understanding of how the stop system works and how it can fail, we need to take a look at how the electricity in this case is generated and how it moves through the system as current. So it may come as no surprise whatsoever that the conductible core of the stop wire is usually made of copper, because copper is a very good conductor of electricity. And what do I mean by a good conductor? Well, to answer that, we'll have to take a look at the smallest part of the copper, the copper atom. And basically, it's the structure of the copper atom that makes copper so conductible. And that is, whilst it's got 29 electrons that orbit its centre nucleus, it's this electron that exists alone on the outside of all of them that allows for that conductivity. And how does it do that? Well, each time the magnetic field of the flywheel's fixed magnet passes some of the copper coiled wire inside the coil pack. This lone outer electron, which has less electrical attraction to its atom, is pushed on forward away from the atom by that magnetic field. And as we will see in a moment, this is pushed towards the next atom. And this atom now doesn't just sit there without an outer electron. And that's because now the electron has moved away, the electrical charge of this atom has changed. It's changed because when all the electrons were present, 29 of them, bearing in mind that all the 29 electrons have a negative charge, for the copper atom, this matched the 29 positively charged protons within its nucleus. So with all the 29 negatively charged electrons and the 29 positively charged protons, this means that the overall charge of this atom is neutral, because both charges, although being opposite, are equal in strength. But now this particular atom has lost one of its negatively charged electrons. That means that it only has 28 negatively charged electrons, but it still has 29 positively charged protons. That means that the overall positive charge for this particular atom outweighs the negative charge. But because it has lost an electron, whilst that electron is not present, it's no longer called an atom. It's called an ion. And of course, because the overall charge is positive now, it's called a positive ion. And the scientific name for a positively charged ion is a cation. And that means because it has an overall positive charge, it will attract a negative charge, which is in the form of another negatively charged electron. And as soon as this new negatively charged electron enters the orbit of the positively charged cation, it becomes an atom once again neutral in charge, because we've got the same amount of negatively charged electrons as we have positively charged protons. But how does this all relate to creating an electrical current? Well, to answer that, will bring in some more atoms. And so using this in a very basic and easy way to explain it, the important thing to focus on here is the lone outer electron that we looked at. Because it was this electron that was pushed this way by the magnet's magnetic field. Now of course, the magnet moving past the wire wouldn't just move the electron from one atom, it would move the electrons from billions. I'm just making this simple example. So to get things going, let's imagine that this electron has received enough stimulus or enough power of strength to move it out of the orbit of its atom and towards the next atom. As it's pushed towards there, it encounters the negative charge of the next outer electron. 
and as we know, it's only opposites that attract, so only positive and negative will come together. Two negatives repel each other. And so as this negatively charged electron is forced towards the next negatively charged electron, it pushes this electron out of its orbit. And because momentarily this atom loses its outer electron, as we've seen, it now becomes a positive ion. And that attracts the negatively charged electron that was originally forced towards it. And so this electron settles into its orbit. And of course, momentarily, this makes it a neutrally charged atom again. So in a nutshell, the electron that was forced towards this atom has pushed its outer electron out of place and took its place. I'm giving this explanation nice and slowly so we can get an understanding, but all of this would happen at something close to the speed of light. So we know about this atom and its electron, but what about the atom it's just come from? Well, as we've seen, because this no longer has an outer electron, it now becomes a positive ion, and it wants to attract a negatively charged electron. And so where does it get it from? Well, it doesn't get it from this way, because there's a force which pushed the electrons that way, away from the atom. So it's going to take it from this way. So it will now attract the electron from this atom. So how could the attraction of this ion possibly pull the electron out of the atom's orbit? Surely it has the same strength of attraction to keep the electron exactly where it is, in its orbit. Well, the answer to that might lie in the electrical circuit itself. Because just for simplicity, if we imagine the electrical circuit being in a loop like this, then we can now imagine that when a stimulus moves one electron from an atom across to the next atom, and that electron then forces the electron from that atom forward, then that's going to keep going on as like a chain reaction down the system. Each time an electron is moved across, it moves the one in front of it, and the one in front of it moves the one in front of it, and it just keeps going like that right round the circuit, creating a movement of electrons in this certain direction. So then it's clearer to see that whilst this atom is in a positive state as an ion, ready to accept a negatively charged electron, then the system is ready to actually provide that, because there would be a flow heading this way. This negatively charged electron would be pushed across to it by the electron before it. So we can see now as far as this system goes that when we move electrons across it causes that chain reaction and all those electrons move in that direction and this is what we call electron flow. This is the electrical current. And of course if we want to keep the flow we've got to keep providing the stimulus to move those electrons across and that's done by repeatedly passing the ignition coil with the fixed magnet on the flywheel. So our system would consist of the copper coiled wire in the coil pack where the electrons are pushed forward initially and then it goes through the electrical wires either through the HT lead to the spark plug, down the special conductive core of the plug and now these trillions of negatively charged electrons can sense ground and because this ground is more positively charged than themselves they arc across the gap and as they arc across the gap that's creating the spark and they instantly move through the outer grounded area of the spark plug and into the engine body where it's not necessarily positively charged but because it's more positively charged than all of those negatively charged electrons that's why they're attracted to it and for that reason this is what's known as a ground the engine body, or the ground, then has contact with the ignition coil and some of the copper coiled windings inside. And so the electrons would flow like this, from the coil, to the spark plug, to the engine body, and back to the coil again. Now I'm not saying that the engine block has a direct contact with the coil windings all of the time, because if it did so, then the electrons wouldn't flow to the spark plug, they'd go direct into the engine block, because that would be the path of least resistance to the more positively charged engine ground. And I'll explain why this is the case very shortly. But nevertheless, because we've bypassed the spark plug, the engine just wouldn't run. But as far as the electron flow from the engine body back to the coil goes, the circuitry design of this coil allows for that transfer of electrons as and when it's required at the right times. 
basically the system that allows the electrons to flow right through. Remember, what I'm trying to say here is where the electrons are replenished from. Because if the electrons weren't somehow replenished in the copper coiled windings, then it would surely run out of electrons, and obviously that does not happen. So this is where the circuit of electron replenishment comes in. This is where the copper coiled windings keep finding the electrons from to use in the system. So then, when the electron flow is created, it will either stay in this circuit, going through the spark plug, allowing the engine to run, or it will bypass the spark plug, going from the coil through the kill wire to the engine body, thus preventing the spark and stopping the engine. And of course at this point the flywheel is no longer turning so there's no longer a stimulus for any electron flow in a certain direction. Therefore no electric current produced. So under normal working conditions of the engine how are the electrons specifically directed to the spark plug in order for the engine to run and how are they redirected away from the spark plug in order to stop the engine? Well, as the magnetic field pushes those electrons forward out of the coil, through the HT lead and into the spark plug, as long as the electrons use this specific route to ground, there'll always be a spark. But that's not something we want to happen all of the time. Because to turn off an engine, such as the one on this little petrol lawnmower, we need to turn off the spark. And removing the spark ultimately means that we'll have to get these electrons to take a different route through to ground rather than through the spark plug. And this is where the kill wire or the stop wire comes in. Because the stop wire has a direct connection from the coil to the engine ground. And between the two of course there's the stop switch. So if we look at that on an actual lawnmower we'll see that we've got the ignition coil bolted onto the engine block right next to the flywheel. And underneath it right here we can see the stop wire, or the kill wire, the earth wire, and we can see the spade connector where it connects to the unit which is in direct contact with the coil within. So the wire runs from this point underneath the coil right round to the back of the engine where it meets the switch which is underneath this cover on this particular type of mower. So the wires run from the coil to the back of the engine to the switch here and it terminates onto this part where it's got a direct contact with these parts. So all of this highlighted area has a direct connection to the stop wire and these areas are separated from its stand and the engine block which are both ground by some special insulation material here. And so it's this special tip that's connected to the kill wire that's the only part that comes into contact with this movable area here which is also part of the engine ground. So when the operator pushes the lawnmower's OPC lever or operator safety lever what it's really doing is pulling this part of the switch away disconnecting the two. And at the same time it pulls away a special little brake pad which has been holding the flywheel in a certain position when the safety switch is not pressed. So in this position where we would say the switch is on or open that is in the position ready to start the engine there's no direct link to ground. So when the coil generates its electric current the electrons can only sense ground this way through the spark plug. And that's of course the reason they naturally flow there. But when the electrical current inside the coil is generated, the electrons want to use the most easy and direct route to ground. And that means that when the stop switch is in the off position, creating a direct link to ground, then this now becomes the most favourable and direct route for the electrons to reach ground. And that means if the electrons are finding ground this way, then they are not going this way and arcing across the spark plug gap in order to find the ground, thus creating the spark. So that's now stopped the spark from occurring and stopped the engine. But the question is, why don't the electrons, or at least some of the electrons, still want to come this way? Because after all, there's still a ground here. 
Well, remember I said a few moments ago that the electrons want the most direct and quickest route to ground. And therefore, because of this, they will always choose the stop wire because that has direct physical contact between the coil and ground. Whereas this way, there's no direct physical contact to ground because of the spark plug gap. And so the attraction of ground for the electrons would be weaker through the spark plug and so a stronger pull there for the electrons. When I say pull, I don't mean physically pulling the electrons to ground, but more of the electrical attraction that the electrons have for the ground. And so when the stop switch is in the on position, breaking any physical route to ground whatsoever, then the electrons will be attracted to the next best ground, and that's the ground through the gap of the spark plug. And so two things happen simultaneously when the operator releases the OPC lever. Firstly, as we've seen, the electrons go straight to ground and cut off the spark. At the same time, the special brake pad contacts the flywheel and stops the engine from rotating. So when this is let go, it's the safety mechanism to stop the engine and the blade instantly. How does this all relate to engine failures? Well, quite a common cause can be down to the kill wire itself. Because if there's any breakage in the wire or outer insulation damage, allowing the centre core that carries all that electron flow to contact the engine block, then all of those electrons are going to take that quickest route to ground, rather than through the spark plug. And of course when this happens, we call it a short in the stop wire. And that's of course if the short is between the coil and the stop switch, because if it's lower than the stop switch, then it's just another grounding, it's not a problem. And a quick and simple way to test to see if it is the kill wire that's actually shorting on the block, is to just disconnect the kill wire. It's important that the kill wire is disconnected at the coil, rather than the other end at the switch. Because disconnecting it from the coil will eliminate any possible shortage or breakages in the wire that are touching the block along the whole length of the kill wire. Disconnecting it from the switch might not be sufficient to detect a problem along the length of the wire from the coil to the switch. It could still be shorting out on the engine block somewhere between those two points. So if we go ahead and remove the kill wire from the coil, and then the engine starts, then you can pretty much guarantee that the kill wire was shorting into the engine block somewhere between the coil and the switch. But assuming that there's no problem with the kill wire itself, it can't be ruled out that the switch and the earthing mechanisms involved in the switch aren't somehow faulty and they are causing the short. So in other words, it's just earthing out when it shouldn't be but it's more likely to be the kill wire. The trouble disconnecting the kill wire now though, is that we can't just stop the engine that easily because of the fact that we've just removed an important part of the stop mechanism, the stop wire. So there's now the case of trying to pull off the spark plug cap or something like that to stop the engine, either that or refit the kill wire. But I personally don't like to do this because of the safety implications in doing so. Because if we pull off the spark plug cap, then there's a likelihood that we'll get an electric shock and it can damage the ignition coil in the process. And also let's remember that if we are refitting the kill wire, then we're doing so with an engine that's running and we've got no guard protecting us from the turning flywheel. Although I do know lots of people who do it this way, I personally would rather not. So what I've actually done in the past is use a multimeter. Because using a multimeter, in my opinion, is a much safer way of doing it. Because you don't even have to start the engine and have all the safety issues to deal with whilst doing so. They are pretty cheap nowadays, you can get them for around £10. So this is the process that I use to test for the short. So I take my multimeter and I turn the dial switch at the front to this setting. This is the continuity setting, and I'll explain a little bit more about this in just a moment. But for now, just make sure that the switch is pointing to this symbol. And then we've got the multimeters, positive and negative probes. The black probe is the negative probe, 
and for this particular test the negative probe's plug must be plugged in to the socket that says COM. And then for the red probe, which is the positive, its plug must be plugged into this socket. This stands for volts, ohms and milliamps. OK, so I'll explain now what the continuity function is and how it works exactly. Within the multimeter is a small battery. And on the continuity setting, this battery sends out a small current, or what we now know and understand as a flow of electrons, out of the multimeter through the negative probe wire. And if we now touch the negative and positive probes together, we get this buzzing noise. And so why is that? Well, when the two probes are touching, electrons can flow out of the comms socket, through the negative wire and out of the negative probe, into the positive probe, down the positive wire and into the positive socket, where the multimeter picks up the electron flow and the buzzer that's built into the multimeter activates. And it's this continuous unbroken flow of current that's known as continuity. So needless to say, when the two probes separate, even though there's an attempt by the battery to send current up through the negative wire, then it's not going to go down the positive wire and it's not going to enter the positive socket. And so, of course, there is break in the current and no continuity and no buzzer will sound. But if we take the positive and negative probes and we touch them on each end of a chunk of metal, like an engine block, then we're going to complete that electron flow circuit again out of the negative probe, through the engine block, into the positive probe and back into the multimeter where the buzzer will sound. And now we're back to having an unbroken electron flow through the system. And so in essence we've used the engine block to gain continuity of the current once again. So then, how does this all relate to me wanting to use this multimeter to test if there's a short in the kill wire? Well, the best way to show that is to go through the actual procedure. But before doing so, in order to gain a firm understanding, I'll show what's going on under normal working conditions before the OPC lever has even been pressed or it's been let go of. So it's in the off position. That way I can explain what's going on with the electron flow from the multimeter through the system on this particular engine and then back to the multimeter to take the reading. And again, thanks to the help of the multimeter, this is a really good test to see if the stop system is actually working. And the best of it is, we don't even have to start the engine. So again, making sure that we're on the continuity setting, there are two main ways we can test using this multimeter to see if there is a short in the kill wire. So firstly, if the kill wire hasn't been removed from the coil and the flywheel cover or the recoil housing hasn't been removed, then we can test for shorts at the switch because we can expose the switch much quicker and easier and simpler than removing the recoil housing. But like in this instance, if we already have the flywheel cover off and the ignition coil exposed like this, which is something I would rather do personally, so I can have a quick look round the components inside there before I do the test. Although, like I've said, it's not the only way, or necessarily the quickest way of doing it. But I find it a more thorough way of doing it, and it only takes a few minutes more than just testing at the switch. So then, we can test it in the following way. We place the negative probe into the back of the kill wire connector, where it connects to the ignition coil. You can see that the bolts that hold this coil in place have been removed and this coil is actually loose, but you don't need to loosen the coil on yours. I've only loosened the coil for the benefit of me taking the video. You'll notice that I haven't actually had to remove this connector because the metal tip of the probe is touching the metal spade connector behind this white plastic cover. And now that's in place and the lever is released, allowing the switch to spring back and create a direct contact, the multimeter now sends its small current of electron flow up into the negative probe and the metal spade connector before continuing through the kill wire to the back of the engine and to the switch. And because the switch is in its sprung back position, then the kill wire has direct contact to earth. 
and so the electron flow continues out of the kill wire through into the engine body. So just to make a point that the electron flow goes into the engine body, I've just put these highlighted dots there. But what we do now, of course, is take the multimeter's positive probe and then we touch it on the engine body. And because the engine body has that flow of negatively charged electrons, they're attracted to the positive probe of the multimeter. And so they flow that way, down the probe, through the wire and back to the multimeter, where the signal is read and the buzzer activates. And so as we know, this is showing continuity, an unbroken route for those electrons to move from the negative side of the multimeter through the stop wire and the stop switch, through the engine body and then back into the positive side of the multimeter. Therefore, we have continuity and it also shows that the stop system is earthing out when it should be. So, if the engine was running, it would transfer them electrons away from the spark plug into the engine body. And that's exactly what we'd need it to do if we needed to stop the engine. But we've managed to do this test without even starting the engine. So once again, that completed the electron flow through the engine block. So using the multimeter, what we can do now is test to see if the stop mechanism is disengaging to allow the engine to start. And again, we can do this test without actually trying to start the engine. We use the multimeter in exactly the same way, of course. The only difference being is we make sure that the OPC lever is pressed to allow the stop switch to disengage. So then with the OPC lever pressed and the negative probe in exactly the same place as it was before, electrons then flow out of the multimeter just the same and then on through the kill wire to the stop switch. And what the electrons would like to do is flow up the kill wire and down this route and across to Earth. But of course they can't now because the stop switch is working and it's been rotated away from the kill wire mechanism, creating a gap between the two. Too much of a gap for the electrons to arc across and so this acts as a break in the circuit and of course electrons can't go any further. That means there's no electron flow stimulation in the engine body, so when we touch the positive probe to the engine body, then we're not getting any electron flow going down into the positive probe and back to the multimeter. Therefore, there's no continuity of current here, so there's not going to be any buzzer sounded. And that's exactly what we want when we press the OPC lever. We don't want them electrons going to ground, to the engine body. Because when the OPC lever's in this position, it's the start and run position, we want them electrons to go to the spark plug. OK, so I've done some explaining of what happens when the OPC lever is in the start and the stop position. And so let's have a look now then at how this relates to testing the mechanism if the mechanism has a fault in there, stopping the engine from running when we want it to run. Well, again, for this little test, we need to make sure that the OPC lever is in the on position to make sure that we've got that gap in the switch to prevent the electrons passing to the engine body. Then at least we know there isn't some kind of mechanical fault from the lever down through the cable and on the rotating mechanism that it operates. And so when we're sure that everything's mechanically OK, how does the multimeter now test to see if everything's OK electrically? With the starting system. Well, what simply happens here is that the multimeter sends out its current of electron flow up through the negative probe and into the kill wire. But instead of going to the back of the lawnmower to the switch, if there's a short in the kill wire, the charge is going to go so far down the kill wire, but it's going to sense ground way before it gets to the switch. And so at that particular point where there's damage to the kill wire, where it's touching the engine block, those negatively charged electrons within the kill wire are going to be attracted to the more positively charged engine body that the core of the kill wire is now touching. And so all of those electrons are going to fall short of the switch and just flow out of the wire and enter the engine body. And that means, of course, that the engine body is in a similar situation to how it was before the OPC lever was pressed when there was a direct link from the kill wire to the engine body. In the same sort of way, there's a direct link now in an unnatural place. 
and so the engine body has these electrons flowing through it and so when we touch the engine body with the positive probe then we're going to get the buzzer activated because we've completed that circuit of continuity. So in a nutshell if the OPC lever is pressed and we do this test and the buzzer activates then it's likely that we do have a short in the stop system, predominantly in the stop wire. Now this may sound a little complicated to remember, but you don't have to, because I've put together a free printable leaflet that you can find on my website in the link below in the description, which will show you how to do this step by step. I know it's took me a little while to get to this point, and I could have done this much quicker, but the whole essence of this video and my other videos is to give you a deeper understanding why these things are happening. So I really appreciate you watching this through to the end and if you have any comments to further this then please do comment below, I'd love to hear them. In the meantime, I'll be back soon. Thank you for watching.